Welcome, or kia ora, as they say down here in New Zealand. I'd like to welcome everyone to this inaugural seminar in the ESRC series. We are really pleased to have got funding from the ESRC for this seminar series and with our partners in Brunel and Bournemouth. This is an area of work that's been really important to me and for many of my colleagues, so it's great that we're getting recognition for this area as being important. I'm really sorry not to be with you. I had hoped to make it back, but uh, circumstances have changed and I am uh, down under in New Zealand working at the University of Waikato. But um, I've retained my links with Brighton as a research fellow and as have been very involved with helping to set up this seminar series. So I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to lifestyle and informal sports and, and some of the issues that we hope the seminar series will address. And I hope you enjoy the two days. So this seminar series offers an opportunity for academics, researchers from different disciplinary backgrounds to come together with policy makers, educationalists and practitioners to consider the changing role of sport in contemporary lifestyles. I'm sure very many of you are familiar with lifestyle sports and what they are, so I'm just going to give a very brief introduction. There have been various labels used to describe these sports, extreme sport, alternative sports, action sports, adventure sports, and so on. I've used the term lifestyle sport as I feel it encompasses the lived experiences of participants in these mostly individualised activities like windsurfing, surfing, snowboarding, skateboarding and so on. But as commentators have said, rather than the labels, what is really important is the meanings that people give to them and that these sports have provided alternatives and potential challenges to traditional ways of seeing doing and understanding sport. Many action and lifestyle sports gained popularity during the leisure trends of the 1960s and 70s and through this they do share a common heritage although there are important differences between the activities. But core members see their cultures as different to traditional rule-bound, competitive and regulated Western institutionalised sport cultures. So some of the characteristics I think that define lifestyle sports include being predominantly individualistic, with strong bonds and identities, a focus on participation rather than, than spectating or fan, being a fan. They lack formal person-on-person -person competition, as certainly as their raison d'etre or the, the, the core reason for participating. Performances are often judged on the individual's creative reading of the environment, whether that's a wave or a rock wall or a concrete stairwell. And they have particular uses of the bodies and technologies in these spaces. They lack formal rules, boundaries. They're often discontinuous, dynamic and in a constant state of flux. Often taking part in natural environments with close interaction with the Earth's forces. They have, of course, seen a lot, a lot of change over the past few decades, especially in terms of professionalisation, commercialisation and institutionalisation. And this growth has been both in participation and in their increased visibility, visibility across public spaces. By the late 1990s, television and corporate sponsors were appropriating the alternative hedonistic and youthful images of these action sports athletes to sell a range of products. And the X Games have been particularly significant in the popularity of these sports, particularly amongst uh, emerging markets in Asia. Lifestyle sports definitely were the domain of young white Western men but there have been a number of shifts in participation patterns. The demographics are shifting, particularly on the margins of the sports, with 
increasing participation across different social classes and age groups, as well as females. You can see there are some examples of new female participants and consumers. And Krista Coma has talked about a female surfing revolution, and certainly in terms of participation, there are increases amongst young women and girls in some communities. And the evidence suggests participation is not confined to youth. The interest is sustained for many years and some activities well into retirement. We're also seeing different types of groupings, including families and in general, with this rapid growth and development, these cultures are now highly fragmented. With enthusiasts engaging in these different styles of participation often underpinned by physiological differences. And commentators have talked about these, these different uh, groupings from novices to weekend warriors, right through to the highly committed uh, participants and those who engage in formal com competition. So what is the significance of lifestyle sport? Well, certainly there is an increased growth in popularity globally. Um, in the 21st century, these sports are enjoying a period of really rapid growth and, and transformation. It's very important to say that there is a lack of accurate and meaningful survey data. But from the surveys that do exist, which come from Asia, Australasia, Europe and North America, they are all pointing to this increased popularity in these kinds of sports. Um, in the USA in 2003, five of the top most popular sports in the USA were action sports, which included skateboarding, snowboarding and inline skating. I've already mentioned the growth areas of, of areas like girls and young women and older people. And they're also related to changing cultural lifestyles of young people. Some more figures just to illustrate the size and influence of the action sport uh, industry and participation trends. That's again in North America. Uh, the source there is the American sport data showing action sports here on the right. Uh, particularly interesting study is one um, commissioned for the Australian government in 2013 that identified these six mega trends shaping the future of Australian sport and you can see from the bubble there that from extreme to mainstream the rise of lifestyle sports was one of these trends. They also identified a drop in participation in almost all team sports uh, except for soccer. So this is just a, a section there where they're talking about the need to address this uh, increase in lifestyle sports which they talk about tapping into things like people's fragmented lifestyles, time being important and so on. We also need to think about the significance of lifestyle sports in relation to broader cultural trends, changing expressions of self-identity, the overlap between fashion, music, art, and there's some dates, debates also about risk-taking in late modernity and the ways in which uh, young people can be challenged using playgrounds, urban parks, and so on. In terms of the crossover with youth culture, teen polls, particularly in North America, have shown that uh, the, the stars of different lifestyle sports, such as Kelly Slater, the surfer, and Sean White, Tony Hawk, are voted as being more influential than many of the traditional sports people, such as uh, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. And another interesting trend is to look at Google Hits. Um, they're comparing the Olympics, showing a spike during uh, the summer of uh, the London Games, but at most other times 
activities like parkour, skateboarding and so on have much more sustained interest. Of course, the ISC is also recognising the importance in attracting young people and is looking to various lifestyle sports as a way to engage with the youth audience. New activities being considered for the Beijing Games, including skateboarding and kite surfing. So, certainly we need to think about the opportunities that lifestyle sports presents, and hopefully these are issues that will come up during the seminar series. So researchers suggested they can appeal to sporty kids and non-sporty, such as in the research I've been involved with in parkour. When thinking about the appeal... We need to think that when programmes are well organised, action sports can offer children and youth opportunities to develop a different set of social, physical, psychological skills than traditional rural band sports. And the kinds of things that have been identified is that they're self-directed, they have a DIY culture, they're often self-directed, lacking rules and adult control. The lack of formal competition helps children and adults gain a sense of achievement that's not dependent on beating an opponent or other teams. And there's a celebration of the self-expression and create creativity in the use of space and in movement and these strong elements of play. There's been a shift from these sports, people being seen as deviant, to becoming much more responsible, such as the research around skate parks has shown and as already highlighted that these are lifestyle practices that can go through the life cycle they're certainly not confined to youth. One of the issues we'll be looking at later in the series is how social dynamics are played out in these sports particularly in the way that gender, sexuality, class and, and race uh, is reproduced through different sporting spaces. And as some of these sports are now being taken on board in different policy contexts, including sport development, what lessons can be learned? In terms of challenges, as I've mentioned, there's definitely a lack of evidence. The existing surveys, like Sport England's Active People Survey, tend not to answer the type of questions that will really get at these, the types of participation in these sports. So measuring participation rates is pretty fraught with problems. And in the UK, Sport England's focus on national governing bodies certainly presents problems for sports that may not have a national governing body that's agreed upon or want one. So there's been a lack of funding through sport policy avenues, although there is funding often through arts and, and youth areas. The perception of risk has sometimes been a, a barrier. Another challenge is that informal sports have different barriers and forms of exclusion. And certainly at the elite level, the gendered and racialised power relations may well be reproduced as in traditional sports. Engaging with policymakers is really important to try and understand these trends. And Holly Thorpe and I recently gave a talk at the New Zealand um, Sport New Zealand's uh, annual conference, looking at action sports in New Zealand communities. And we organised a panel where we had participants from action sport programs and also some of the um, leaders of big sports organizations like rugby and netball discussing their potential it was really great to see action sports getting on the agenda and it was something that was considered to be very productive so we hope that that dialogue will continue so back to the seminar program here uh, we have six seminars and the last one will have a lifestyle sport festival we hope you'll be able to attend many of them after the this first one there'll be one day seminars and there'll be more uh on more specific topics our broad objectives as you see there is to um not only engage in topical and scholarly debate but to engage with different communities and we really hope to establish some innovative approaches uh, for enhancing and developing active lifestyles and uh, influencing policy across the, the spectrum. Thank you. And I really hope you enjoy the two days. 
please do use social media as a way to publicise these um, seminars and as a form of dialogue. I'm sure you, that Mark uh, and the team will talk to you about the website, um, how to tweet, uh, and I look forward to hearing the hearing the talks.